Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Colony Drop, your favorite Gundam podcast. My name is Isaac. And my name is Brian, and this is a podcast where we talk about anything and everything related to the Mobile Suit Gundam franchise. From the anime, to the music, to the models, to the movies, clothes, food, music, you name it, we do it all. That's absolutely right, Brian. And today we're talking about something that I'm glad we're talking about. I'm glad it's behind us. I'm glad it's in the rearview mirror, and we don't have to do this again. We're talking about... The last half of Victory Gundam, which, if you recall, we saw the first half, oh, God, two months ago? (laughs) It was. More? Yeah, I think it was a little over two months ago. Yeah, we're biting the bullet today, everyone, and just going to finally get through that last half of Victory. I think it's like, we should probably just tell the listeners how we arrived here, Isaac, because I don't think we originally planned to do it this soon. No. But last week, we were trying to play Battle Operation 2, and turns out... I could not actually run the game because I I didn't have Windows 10. This entire podcast has been produced, if you will, on Windows 8.1, which apparently is like too old to run anything now. <laughs> Steam will let you install the game. It just won't let you play it. Oh, Steam. Then Isaac just got like frustrated. He was like, I'm just going to watch Victory. Can't take it anymore. No, and I got frustrated because, oh God, hopefully other people have played this game that are listening to this podcast, but you go through tutorial hell. When you start the game, like there's no way to skip these tutorials. It's very <laughs> Japanese RPG, like Final Fantasy style, right? Where like your your home base is this base, literally. But to get to different tasks and things to do, you have to have your pilot character run around the base, <laughs> going from like person to person at different little kiosks or desks or or tables or whatever they're standing near to do different things and it is maddening it is not at all anything like like battlefield just you know jump into battle <laughs> no it, or, or counter strike whatever even uh gun of evolution this is completely the opposite oh <laughs> god and uh it was it was hell i got frustrated i did like two battles and then they weren't even against real people um and then i was i just dipped out i was like i'm done I'm I'm gonna go finish Victory Gundam because at least I know that has progress. <laughs> <laughs> he was so angry, he just decided to keep the anger going and watch Victory. Yeah. And he blitzed through but- it in like two days. All of a sudden he was like done the next day and I was like, Oh god, now I have to watch it. <laughs> it was like a night. <laughs> and I had uh and I had COVID this week, Isaac, so I watched Oh god. <clears throat> what better mood to put yourself in than to get COVID and watch Victory <laughs> Gundam at the same time. Well, Brian, you put it in the perfect words. You put it as bite the bullet. And Victory Gundam, this last half, much like the first half, was just a depleted uranium bullet (laughs) that was incredibly dense and just a horrible thing to chip your teeth on because, (laughs) oh, God, I did not enjoy Victory Gundam Part 1. Definitely not part two, which we'll talk about now, and not the whole series in totality. (laughs) Brian, do you somewhat agree with me? Do you fully agree with me? Do you disagree? (laughs) I don't know. I feel like I'm somewhere in the middle. I ended up feeling very similar about this back half as I did the front half, where two-thirds of the time, roughly, it was very just sort of meandering and aimless, and I felt very bored. And then the last, like, five or six episodes... We're like really engaging and all of a sudden everything kind of comes together and stuff happens. But like that doesn't really necessarily make a good series. You know, you, you can't have 15 good episodes out of 51 to call it a good series. So I, I would say this show is probably one half to one third too long. You could just cut okay. it down and you just don't need it. Without question. I would compare this very much to Wing Gundam in the feeling of boredom I got for many of these character arcs. The lack of interest I felt at a lot of scenes, a lot of episodes. I just wanted them to move on. It felt like Wing Gundam (sighs) so much with its (laughs) boredom. And that's frustrating because this was the Universal Century. Right from the get-go, they start us out with the space fascists are up to no good. So we didn't have to deal with like Ramafeller nonsense or some new faction that isn't really villainous, but it can occasionally be villainous or somewhat bland at times too, like uh, the Bannerit group from Witch from Mercury. And this was just such a slog to get through. I didn't enjoy it at all, and I really don't see myself rewatching it ever again. 
Yeah, I, I think it would be a hard a hard thing to revisit. It would have to be a, quite a while from now. Yeah. I think 10 years would have to go by, Isaac, before I decide to rewatch this show. And I'd probably have to have a reason. Like, there'd probably have to be a sequel or something, uh, a real reason to revisit the show in a, in a full, you know, front-to-back manner. And I think the fans back us up, Brian, because there is a dearth of Zanscare mobile suits, of fans creating Zanscare mobile <laughs> suits, of fans creating anything League Militaire in terms of the the Gundam, or the, the sorry the Gundams or other mobile suits. This is just the the black sheep of Gundam, the Universal Century. It's it's just bland. Like say what you will about F nine one and how that really was a kind of a wobbly landing, didn't stick the landing, but that's got zest to it. That's got <laughs> interest, right? It's it's like, oh, F nine one, crossbow and vanguard, they're pretty interesting. You know, let's just check this out. It's it's definitely an interesting series. You can't really say that about Victory Gundam, which is uh oh oh god, it was just a, a boredom battle. A <laughs> battle with boredom to just keep my autoplay on as I keep cycling through to the next episode and I just sat there just just ridiculously wondering how something so bad could be done and uh, I, I know the, the rumor or the general open secret is that Tamino was depressed during this creation right? During this series being produced? He was, yeah. Yeah, that okay. seems to be the, the case. He was battling depression and that supposedly is a reason why so many characters meet such brutal ends and uh, i guess it just reflects in the series how he was just not on his a game when this was done so this would obviously not be a game material the brutality has definitely turned up a notch in this back half for sure i feel like he tried to do a lot but his heart wasn't in it and we got a lot of starts and stops and just too much of everything and it Again, I think a half or a third of it is probably unnecessary. And But yeah, I did write up a summary, Isaac. So we're going to do a summary oh so boy. that people can, instead of watching 51 episodes, they can just listen to our two, uh, our two podcasts and <laughs> generally get the gist of the show. Yeah, I mean, before you even get to that, you, you kind of just led me into saying this right now, Brian, that I do not recommend this to Gundam fans. <laughs> It is not a good show. <laughs> I mean, I think I think you should try to watch it if you're a Universal Century fan and you want to watch every Universal Century thing, but I would definitely put it definitely behind all of the Tamino works, including Double Zeta. I was about to say it's almost like the Star Wars holiday special, but then I, I stopped myself because at least that's almost so bad it's it's good in a way, like so bad you kind of have to see it. This is just so boring and bland that you, you'd you be wasting your time. There's better things to watch, better non-Gundam things to watch. 51 episodes, and this is how it ends? This is how the story went? Give me a break. It did end a little abruptly. But uh, enough of this, Brian. Get get to your <laughs> get to your summary of this last back half, which is going to have so many switchbacks and reversals <laughs> that it's it just sounds like it was... It was written by, like, a group of interns that, like, you know, each one kept getting fired before, like, handing it off to the next one or something, yeah. right? You can only pass Shakti back and forth between the good guys and the bad guys so many times, Isaac, before it loses all effect. You can really only go back to Earth and space back and forth so many times before a certain point where, like, look, wh who's running the strategy? We really should just focus on one, you know? <laughs> Pick one theater and stick there. Yes. But, yeah. All right, here we go, Isaac. Buckle up. Similar to the first half of the show, this the show is a very difficult to write a, a summary of. This is why there's not a whole lot of stuff about the show on the wiki, you know? Because no one wants to write it because it's very confusing and it would take forever. Because it's bad. I think I got a lot of it, <laughs> but I probably didn't get everything exactly right. But this is about what happens, okay? I wish I was in a guillotine. Go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> if you remember, guys, when we last left off, the first half of the show, our heroes had led a raid on the Zanskir home colony. Uh, which I forgot what it's even called, and I don't even really care anymore. They had been captured, though, <laughs> and they had just gotten their suits back. Remember, they went to that, like, assembly, and they were about to leave, but then Katagina showed up again with her, her new suit, and she had her sights aimed at Uso. So they, they tussle a little bit, but Marbet and Junko, uh, and, and Junko is, this time is, comes in a new suit called the Gun Blaster, Isaac, who we're going we're gonna to see that suit the rest of the show. They save Uso from Katagina, who ends up indiscriminately murdering civilians because that's just kind of what Katagina does. She's kind of like firing everywhere, 
And Marbet has one of the best takedowns of the series right here when she says, she tells Katagina that little rich girls who don't understand war should go home. And I thought that was great. More people need to hear that. <laughs> I suppose so. <laughs> <laughs> the Rainforest Junior, uh, which is now the junior model, Isaac, this is where they you know, took the old, I think it's Ag- Alexandria class, they combined those squid parts on it. So for the rest of the show, our... Our main ship is going to be the Rainforest Junior or the Reinforce. No one answered my question, Isaac, if it's really pronounced Rainforce or Reinforce. It better be Reinforce. I would assume it's Reinforce, but I'm pretty sure the way they spell it in the subs indicate, on in the official subs, they, they add an E after the N. So to me, that means it's Rainforce, but I could this be wrong. doesn't make it... What, uh, ra- uh, oh, I don't know. I don't no. know. This must be like when someone of another language hears two words that sound similar, like Reinforce and Rainforest. <laughs> so they, they threw them together almost like with the spelling and that's how we got here could be but it's it's reinforce i don't i don't know i I said the whole first part i said rain should i go with reinforce this time just to mix it up and that way i'm always i'm i'm right in one sunset has decreed that is canon reinforce all right we're going reinforce our reinforce junior <laughs> they planned everyone there you know captain gomez and fake Jin Jana hannah hannah they plan to fire Kylas Geely at Zanskir, the colony, because the Sugan fleet is there nearby, too. So their idea is, hey, we're just going to fire on them. We're going to get their colony. We're going to get all their forces all at once. But Chronicle puts a bomb on it, and Junko sacrifices herself to disarm it, but it goes off in her face, and Uso watches her get incinerated. That was rough for me, Isaac. I love Junko. She's like one of my yeah. favorite characters. Horrible. I couldn't believe that. Not only did she die, but she left me in the first episode of the back half. I had to endure the whole other 29, whatever, 26 episodes without my favorite character in the show. God damn it. It only gets worse from here, Brian. (laughs) Because more people Uh. are going to (laughs) die. But she saved Uso, Isaac. So in my book, Junko saved the world. So rest in peace, Junko. You'll be missed. I think I'm going to try to get some like banner art for for our channel, Isaac, with with Junko on one side and maybe Shima on the other. You know, I feel like those are our like spirit women. (laughs) Maybe, but like Shima was just so much more cooler. (laughs) I don't know. I think Junko's pretty cool. If you're going to pick a a good uh, Federation woman, I'm going with Junko. Say what you will about Shima, but she never would have been dumb enough to try to defuse a bomb in front of her face. Junko was <laughs> desperate. She was a brave woman. I'll give her that. I'll give her that. She was very brave. So they do end up firing Kylas Geely, but Katagina, that <laughs> throws off the aim a bit by detonating Chronicle suit, so it misses the colony, but it does get a lot of the fleet, so they did get something out of it. The reinforced retreats to another colony, which I believe is called Macedonia, but they're taken prisoner there, Isaac, because it's under the influence of Zanskar. And everyone on the Reinforce is assigned farm work as POWs, because why not? While there, Marbet and Oliver decide to get married, because that's what you do when you get assigned farm work. Chronicle attacks, though, and Uso gets taken by Katagina. Uh, this was kind of interesting, Isaac. The Macedonia forces don't really like Zanscare. Like, they are, they are like, affiliated with them, but they don't really, like, want them doing operations in their colony. Right. And they end up getting beat up by the Zanskar forces and the League Militaire forces. They got the worst end of the deal. Kind of like what we saw in uh, Crossbone Gundam about how, you know, the different colonies have their own armies. It's kind of kind of what we saw here. Yeah, and even earlier in season, or sorry, season, the first half of victory. Because if you remember, like, there, it's, a, it's almost a throwaway line. It's just one sentence. I think Sugan, Admiral Sugan. Or sugar, whatever, whatever, <laughs> whatever he's really called, Admiral Sugar because he's sweet. Um, <laughs> he throws, he makes a one-off line, right? Like, yeah, one of our fleets in Zanskare is fighting like the side two colony alliance, which it clearly means there's another faction at least, if not multiple factions by this point, with the Federation government seemingly being in the early stages of breaking down. So yeah, there's other groups out there and that was so interesting that we never really found out more about it and my head canon is that's why we didn't really see the full might of Zanskir because their their fleets are kind of busy fighting other groups of colonies right right yeah exactly definitely one of the more interesting things in the show though it would have been more interesting to see more about that and less about some of this other stuff so but while captured Uso is greeted or taken care of by Officer Lupe. C- I think her last name's Sino, but I'm just going to call her Lupe. Uh, this is the, the bath woman, Isaac. So oh, dear. she gets in the bath with Uso and wrestles with him to test him. Uh, he bites her in the boob. And I think she was trying to have sex with him as a means of recruiting him. Or did she just really like young boys? What was her deal, Isaac? What was the deal with Lupe? 
I don't know. I just thought it was just so weird. I don't know if this was like some type of Japanese comedy trope or something. <laughs> yeah, I thought like, is, was this supposed to be funny in Japan? Because it just comes off as weird. But in any case, Uso was able to get the hell out of there via bite. <laughs> She even references it later, like she remembers the bite or something. Yeah, and, you know now they're enemies or whatever. But um, yeah, what a weird scene. Not, not in anime in general, and in Gundam especially, because that's kind of never happened in any other Gundam series. Not even close. Yeah, very odd. Very odd tonally for Gundam. Um, I could definitely see it in a different show. Yeah, like a comedy anime. Y- yeah, something like that. But very, very odd for this particular arena that we're in. So. Uh, Uso does escape, like you said. He escapes naked. He runs through the halls naked, gets in his core fighter naked, flies away. He transfers to some somewhere else, either the V2 or back to the ship via air bubble from Haro. That was also very odd. And he receives the victory too, Isaac. So it's such a weird thing. In one of the wackiest episodes of Gundam ever, we, it's the first appearance of like one of the strongest Gundams. Uh-huh. <laughs> Which, yeah, it's just a very, very odd like comparison there. Um... We find out that uh, the V2 is from the moon, probably from Anaheim. We could do a whole separate episode about that because it's not really discussed in the show. But given that it came from the moon, seems like it likely came from Anaheim. Yeah, where else, right? Yeah. It was designed by Uso's mom, whose name is Myra Miguel. We're going to meet her and then say goodbye to her very soon. Oh, this was a good part. I think the next time they fight Zanskare, uh, they're now using those tires, Isaac, your favorite thing, the tires. I think they're called the Einrads, oh right? And now they're using them in space. And Marbet has one <laughs> another great line. She says, you're not supposed to use tires in space. <laughs> That's correct, yeah. Marbet. You're not. <laughs> I think in my translation, it was like, you know, why are you using wheels in space or wheels don't work in space? Something, like, something very dismissive of it. And she makes a good point because why does it need to rotate I don't know. in space to move? Like... <laughs> Oh, Zanskari, your your engineering and your goals. We're not even at the Motorrad fleet, <laughs> but oh god, or oh god, this just continues. You know what we said about the first half of season one, Brian, with um those ridiculous motorcycles. Oh yeah, and then uh, how this was clearly the result of one executive who was like, <laughs> oh, you know, motorcycles are the most thrilling vehicle in the world, or you know, <laughs> bi wheeled vehicles are the most thrilling vehicles in the world. We have to put them in Gundam. Yep. You know, like yep. the, the same ver- the Japanese equivalent of the spider being the most vicious killer in the animal <laughs> kingdom. But here we are. Wheels in space. My God, wh- how far Gundam has fallen. I did end up putting a, a little extra bit into the last episode. There, I did find one article that did talk about that, and I think there was somewhere that said, you know, they, they basically wanted Tomino to put battleships in, in the show. And so he's like, okay, I'm, I'll, put, I'll put in the battleships. And I think this is part of it, Isaac, where you're just like, you want battleships? I'll give you wheels, too. <laughs> I mean, he didn't even need to go that far, though, because... Almost every ship in Gundam is already a battleship. <laughs> but I feel like they dared him, and he was like, I'm just going all in on it. This is what you want. I'm going to give it to you. Yeah, this is like, I, I guess, in, the ho- in like homework in high school or something. Like <laughs> uh, You're given these instructions, and you like follow it to the letter, but you know it's against the spirit of what like, the teacher wants, but you just turn it in anyways, and you're like, that's what you literally told us to do. <laughs> well, here you go. I told you it would be bad, but you yeah, wanted it. I followed the rules. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, the reinforced retreats to the moon, trying to get to their factory. They're damaged, Isaac. But they have to stop in a lunar city called St. Joseph, which is actually like a huge lunar city. Probably another one of the more interesting parts of the show. Was it like covered in a force field or like how did that work? I don't know. I was just very confused. I, I, I was kind of more perplexed slash hypnotized by how it seemed to be. It was so big. It felt like Earth. It was very big. It was very big. Yeah, the streets felt like an Earth city, unlike 0083 where we see the moon. And even looking at the streets and stuff, we're kind of like, well, we're clearly on the moon um, or inside some internal building, you know? Yeah. But here it was, no, I, I, yeah, I I don't know if that was a force field or not. Yeah, because I didn't see a dome. But to your point, I was having trouble understanding where the barrier was between the city and the moon. And yeah, right. Very strange. Um, they meet Myra there, Isaac, by accident. She's fending off some, like, Bespa thugs, if I recall. Of course. And they figure out that the Motorad fleet is near and going to launch towards Earth. Shakti has a dumb idea that she should go talk to them. She gets captured. She gets stolen back. Captured again, back and forth a few times, because that's what Shakti does. 
She's like yeah. a package. You just send her back and forth with like free shipping. You know what? This is F91 vibes all over again with uh, Cecily slash Vera Rona. Mm, and yep, yep. I was just I, w- I was just like, oh, God, what what are you doing? You're trying to see your mother. You're the princess. They clearly respect you. And then you're like, you go back to your friends. But then you want to go back to your mother. And then you get kidnapped. <laughs> God, just uh, stop. <laughs> and she does this like three or four times in the show. Where she's like, I'll just go talk to him and ask him not to do it. And it never works. And so, like, I get doing it the first time. But the second, third, fourth, fifth time you do it, I don't know. Then it's like, either you're dumb as a character or you're just phoning it in on the writing side. And, again, I don't think Tamino was super overly concerned about it. Right, yeah. The Motorrad fleet does launch towards Earth. And now the Motorrad fleet is led by Chronicle and Pippinidin, Mr. Pip. This is like a reward for Chronicle, Isaac, because he did so well in the in the fight against Kylas Geely. He gets to lead the Motorrad squad. However, Oliver tries to stop them by kamikaze his core fighter into their giant flagship. I guess he thought that would stop them, Isaac. This was a dumb death to me, though, because it clearly wasn't going to work. His core fighter was not big enough to stop their ship. No, and yes, it was a dumb death. I got uh, her- heroic kamikaze like suicide. <laughs> I was trying <laughs> to understand it. I was like, this is just silly, you know? It- yeah, and he's like, and as he does it, he's like, Marbit, take care of our child. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> it does nothing, too. <laughs> it, it literally did nothing. Well... Maybe not nothing. It seemed to, like, damage the front of that one ship. Yeah, but then they right? literally, like, launched to Earth either right after that episode yeah. or, or even the next episode. So it was completely they yeah. in vain. They didn't need to stop, I think. <laughs> no, I think they were kind of like, oh, he hit the thing. Should we, like, brush it off or, like, keep going? Uh, it won't affect us once we do reentry. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully the heating tiles are okay. Yeah. Someone with the mop needs to go out there and get that hamburger off the front wheel. Oh, jeez. <laughs> So Oliver's dead. He, you know, he believes Marbet is pregnant, which is odd because Marbet doesn't know she's pregnant. No one else knows she's pregnant. So I'm not sure how Oliver knew he, she was pregnant. So so it goes. That's going to be a bigger story down the road. Zanskare sends out the Dagorla, which is a mobile armor shaped like a Chinese myth dragon. So imagine Shenron from Dragon Ball. And it is, it's a bad design. Let's just say <laughs> that. It is a bad design. It's kind of too slender, and uh, the tail is almost infinite. That was weird. It's very long. Yeah, the sections can, like, yeah. replace themselves, like, if one gets cut. And it wasn't impressive at all because it gets destroyed that same battle, that same episode. <laughs> well, I loved it because they were like, now nah, you can slice us as much as you want, and we won't die. But then Usa's is like, okay, I'll just slice you vertically instead of horizontally. Yeah. <laughs> and then it lost. <laughs> he cut it, like, perfectly down the middle, too. It was great. Uh, so because Oliver's gone, uh, Marbit gets the V-shaped uh, fin antenna on her Victory Gundam. You know, so again, the Motorrad fleet does launch towards Earth. They go into re-entry. The sites fight into into re-entry, which is a classic Gundam fight, the re-entry fight. However, in this case, everyone lands on Earth. For some reason, they land on an, on an island, Isaac, where they find a, like, Maria cult. Yeah, very weird. And they're inside the cult, and uh, Uso's in there, Shakti's in there, Katagina's in there, and she, she tells everyone, hey, Shakti right here is Maria's daughter. So they capture Shakti again, and then Uso fights an underwater version of the Dagorla. So he fights a water dragon this time, and uh, he wins again. Same thing. Yeah, I don't, I will. I mean, it was doing better than, like, pretty much anything else they had been using up to this point. Was it? Other than the, like, the <laughs> Abigor. Remember the Abigor guy? He was cool. I, I kind of feel like your space specialty mobile suit should never be in the water. <laughs> like, there's no way it could p- possibly be good in the water, right? There's no water Gelgoogs. There's no water Doms, <laughs> right? Well, watch. I'll probably go, like, to MHQ and, like, they're there. But, um, like, theoretically, there can't be, right? You need something specialized for water to be better in water. So it was ridiculous to see this thing in the water. That They clearly just wanted to recycle the design. So as soon as I saw the orange one, I was just like, whatever. Just kill it, Uso. <laughs> just get it out of here so we can leave this this really bizarre cult island that's like there's an underwater base, but they also live on top of the island, which was weird. <laughs> it was, yeah. Yeah, that was very strange. Yeah, I was. I had to rewind the episode. Rewind. Oop, I'm a millennial. <laughs> I had to go back earlier in the episode and watch that part again because I was like, 
wait a minute, is this an underground community? And then I checked again and I was like, no, they're on an island. Why is there this underground base that like doesn't really do anything? <laughs> <laughs> you got to have a presence in land, sea, and air, I guess. They just had set pieces they wanted to do and they just checked them off. Yeah, well, I'm sure someone told him to put a dragon in there too. So he was like, all right, I'm going to make the dragon mobile armor. <laughs> dragon mobile suit. It's useless. And so now we start to meet more of the Motorads, and these are the Motorad ships, Isaac. So the, the League Military is going to fight the Motorads, and they have wheels. They roll on the wheels, obviously, like big cars. But the wheels are, are they have a second purpose, and they crush buildings beneath them as they roll. So they're basically giant steamroller wheels. And they were designed to cleanse the earth without using nukes. Now that's some creative writing, Isaac. It is the dumbest idea I've ever heard. <laughs> it, it is the equivalent of a country, you know, sending in bulldozers because they want to wipe out the enemy civilization. Like, are you insane? The amount of bulldozers we'll need to wipe a country flat. Have you? I, there, there's no there's no amount <laughs> that's high enough. It's insane. But, you know, to, to really like flatten everything, you'd have to attack it like you're mowing a lawn. You know, where you go in like a nice <laughs> pattern where you go up a and then grid, down yeah. and then up and then down. <laughs> Like, that's what they would be doing. But, you know, over the entire North American continent or something. That's insane, though. Just the scale of it. Like, it's beyond impractical. Like, th this show, Zanskar, is insane. <laughs> like, almost Jupiter Empire levels of insane. Because th there's no logic or pragmatism to any of their plans. It's, it's just nuts. Gas must be really cheap in Zanskar for them to think that this is going to work. Yeah, and the way to do it is with these giant motorcycle battleships, as opposed to, I don't know, I I would have kind of, like, believed it more if they had, like, oh, really, we have an earthquake super weapon, you know, like this big earthquake uh, walker mech thing. I would have been like, okay, I can see them using that to level, you know, large parts of the world and to start over, but this whole thing was just ridiculous. Yeah, this was an interesting one for sure. Even though the, the tires themselves are, are strange, the tires are very tough. What are they made of, Isaac? Because beam weapons don't seem to work very well against them. They're very ineffective. What What is so magical about these tires? I don't know, Brian, but they're they're strong enough with like explosions don't really hurt them, even though they should, because they just they destroy the rest of the ship, <laughs> like the bridge or the cannons. But yeah, whatever they're made out of, it's it's strong. So our heroes waste a bunch of time trying to stop them without really blowing them up. They're very concerned about detonating the reactors on Earth. They don't want to hurt the planet. Uh, Myra ends up getting captured by Chronicle, or somehow she's on their ship. That's going to become important. One of the best but people, his name is Gaz Barl. Yep, that's his real name. Gaz Barl. He is told by uh, Mr. Pip to go attack them, but attack them while holding Myra, Uso's mom, in his hand in his like mobile suit's hand. So she's in like a normal suit and he's like, hey, I'm gonna go attack them. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna hold you. Don't worry though. It's just gonna be like pretend. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> like um, it won't, nothing bad will happen, okay? And You're she's just like, a hostage. are you sure? Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> and even, even Katagina is momentarily like bothered by this. She's like, this seems like not okay. So needless <laughs> to say, this doesn't turn out well. Uh, Uso is trying to get Myra back from Gaza's disabled suit. Uso does successfully disable his suit so he can go get his mom back. But Katagina just won't have it, and, and it bothers her that he, he's trying to take her back. She's like, no, you can't do that. So she, she starts distracting Uso. She, she won't let him get to Gaza's suit to steal Myra back. And at the same time, there's like another motor ad going to crash in to where Gaz is disabled at. <laughs> and, you know, Katagina bothers Uso so much that he can't make it in time, and he gets, he gets plowed into by the ship, and it moves him out of the way, and the ship just smashes right into Gaza's suit and Myra, killing her, dismembering her, decapitating her. Uso finds her helmet with her head in it, that's right, and brings it to the people on the uh -huh. reinforced deck and says, this is my mom, as he holds up her helmet with her head in it to Marbit. Oh my god. I mean, <laughs> I don't know how you go from like the comedy bit, what I'm going to assume was supposed to be a comedy bit with Lupe in the bath to like Uso holding his mom's head. I, I, I know, I know. Oh God, <laughs> this is grotesque. <laughs> There's no other word for this, but grotesque. Like, I don't think we've seen this anywhere else in Gundam. This just continues like his fascination <laughs> with cutting off people's heads. Like we saw earlier with the guillotine. 
that's kind of never happened anywhere else in Gundam. You know, I guess Kaecilia's head coming off, but like that was really her to- her torso kind of coming in half. But yeah, this was it. It was rough. Yeah, that was tough. That was tough to watch. Poor Uso. Um, he you know he obviously did not deserve that. Yeah, I'm not a fan. To make it even worse, he he can't even really get back at them because immediately, like at, like as this is happening, the Federation and Zanskar sign a ceasefire agreement on the moon, and so basically everyone has to stop fighting. And then Gomez, this next section I'm calling the aimless ceasefire. So during the ceasefire, Gomez gives everyone vacation because there's really nothing else to do. So everyone decides to go take some vacation at Casa because they're back on Earth. But on the way, our biker friend Isaac, the guy who was going to revive the spirit of biking, Duker Ick, or however you say this guy's name, he is like, well, the League Military is not part of the ceasefire. It's the Federation and Zanskar, so I'm just going to keep attacking these guys. So I don't really understand the, the point of the ceasefire, Isaac, if Zanskar is just going to keep fighting the, the League Military. So anyway, for the next few episodes, he comes at our heroes trying to kill him, but it doesn't work out. You know, the the, the reinforced squad and the white arc squad you know, eventually get the best of uh, Duker and and his people. What's his girl that he likes? Paloma, I think that's her name. They end up dying. Uh, after they die, their spirits ride off to a cabin on motorcycles that they wanted to live at after the war. <laughs> that was such a weird tangent. Like. First, we know they're going to die, right? Because she's talking about how she's always wanted to live in a cabin or something, right? Yeah. And then they they actually die. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, they were the villains, and it just felt so weird to kind of shoehorn in, you know, by the way, you know that guy that was head of the, the evil motorcycle squad? <laughs> it turns out he's got a heart, you know? <laughs> it turns out he was a noble biker, and he just wanted to live in this cabin, which... It was romanticized that he wanted to live in a cabin, but at the same time, he was, like, going to steal that cabin from someone else, right? <laughs> it's so weird, too, because they do this again with that other Zanscare couple. They do, yeah. Remember? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the one that's, like, they, they were two kind of grunt pilots. They're really kind of shoving in here at the last minute, sort of, the oh, you know, both sides have hearts. And both sides are just people. It's like, <laughs> well, one side is clearly letting women get decapitated, you know, and held right. hostage and having machines flatten the planet. The other side is resisting. Yeah. <laughs> like, what's your point here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It was, it was very odd. The whole thing reminded me of, like, when your parents retire and they decide it's a good idea to get a motorcycle. And... <laughs> <laughs> like it's just unnecessary you don't need it yeah yeah it's, it's a donor cycle that's what it is <laughs> don't don't get on it <laughs> but they are at casarilla so they do bury myra or what's left of her or i guess part of her maybe they just bury her head i don't know i, I feel like they didn't walk away from that battle with her with her body isaac i guess they only had her head right maybe they buried her head yeah i guess i at least it'll be a small casket um, <laughs> 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 you could just shoebox i don't know <laughs> Coming out of that, the main thing I learned, Isaac, was that Katagina was irredeemable. Yeah. For preventing Uso from getting to his mom. Can you remind me again, Brian, how this went and snowballed from her wanting to be like an embedded spy to now being Ryder Dizanskar? I don't know that there was a clear explanation other than. Oh, God. She went there, and then all of a sudden it was just, this is me now, and I'm going to do it. How ridiculous. Okay. I mean, she, okay. Her, her insecurities kind of come out a little bit later but sort of not really we'll we'll get there but just mad at the federation wanting something new she's just she's terrible yeah she's she might be my most hated character in gundam wow well i don't blame you almost no redeeming qualities because this is around episode 34 i think 36 at this point the series is only like a half to two-thirds over and she's already irredeemable to me i don't care what Mm -hmm. happens the rest of the show this next section I'm calling the Bells of the Zanuck, which has got to be your favorite part of the show, Isaac, because it's all about Fuala Griffin. I'll say this. The Zanuck might be my only Zanscare design that I like, and also the only one I'd probably consider buying. It's just so cool, so well designed. It had a cool role in the story. Yeah. Uh, out of everything we've seen, Zanuck's kind of risen to the top in terms of like one of the only good, interesting situations slash little mini bosses they fight. And yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. Out of all the things presented in the back half, outside of maybe the you know the finale, the Zanuck part clearly seemed to be the most well thought out. Right. So they're at Casarelia, and if you remember, listeners, in the beginning there was a place they kept going to called Lagrain, where there's 
some sort of factory or whatever. And they're there again, essentially. And everyone in the place starts to hear these creepy bells, these bells. And there's a tale around there that those who were guillotined wore bells before they were, you know, guillotined. So then it gets a little creepy. It's like, oh, is this the the bells of the guillotine that we hear? But it's not like they're hearing real bells. It's just sort of these, you know, ethereal bells. This is like (laughs) really dating myself, Isaac, but you might remember this. Do you remember that infomercial for uh, Pure Moods back in the day? There was that one song in there called, uh, called, uh, I think it was Silver, no, something Bells, Silver Bells or something like that. I'm going to see if I can find the clip and put it in here. But that's what it reminded me of. Set adrift with the timeless pleasures of tubular bells. Uh, (laughs) So, anyway, some people will get that. It's a great (laughs) reference. If you don't get it, don't worry about it. But then this city gets seemingly orbitally bombarded, Isaac. I was wondering if there was, like, a second satellite cannon, but no. (laughs) Instead, it was just, uh, it's her. (laughs) Yeah, it turns out to be this new suit called the Xanic. It's on this little platform, and they keep calling it a flying saucer. And she's just sitting sort of in orbit, shooting at this city. And it's piloted by the, the queen of the guillotine, Fuala Griffin, who's now has, like, bells on her face. Which I think, I think there was, it went one bell too far. I think if she just dropped the bell in the middle of her face, it would have been better. It just doesn't make any sense. It's such a bizarre, creative take on it that i don't i just don't understand how she needs like okay the the system of the xanic resonates through the bells or something i think that's what she said and she needs those to (laughs) feel where uso's at during combat (laughs) i thought it was purely for like intimidation purposes i didn't think it was actually contributing anything to the actual operation how is it intimidation if no one else can really hear it though no, everyone else was hearing it. That was the thing. Everyone else like, was hearing yeah, the bells. Yeah, they were like getting chills because the, they could hear these bells. And then when they heard the bells, that's when the orbital bombardment was, was happening. So she has speakers on the Xanic. Well, I think it was a new type thing. I think they were you oh, know, feeling God. her her bells resonate. There you go. That's a good... Uh, oh, that's God, sexual. That, <laughs> that is so... <laughs> okay. I, I liked how quick the Xanic was. But I can do without the bells. I can even do without the new type abilities. And I can, because they really didn't work that well. I mean, new type stuff is generally means you need to be like a high performing ace against other new type pilots. Sure, she was able to survive a few times against Uso. But the ultimate point of the Xanic seems really to be as a an orbital bombar- bombardment platform. You don't really need new type powers at all to point at a city and pull the trigger. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. So did you get the sense, like, I I felt like when she came back, she was a lot more powerful as a new type. Yeah. Do you feel like she was cyber enhanced or like... She had to have been. That's the only way I took it, you know, uh, that she got, uh, she's a cyber new type now with, um, what's his name, Tassilio? Yeah, Tassilo, yeah. Tassilo under Tassilo. She went from kind of being an officer in command to now she's just a, 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 essentially a, a super weapon herself in a way. So yeah. That's that's her character arc. <laughs> yeah, I haven't like checked that to see if that's the the real story, but I assume that ha- that has to be it. Otherwise, I don't know. She didn't really have that new type ability before, or, or apparent new type ability. So she, she's a half insane sub boss. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know, because it's in, they, they sort of chase the Zanuck away, but then then the League military chases it to space. So now we're going back to space, Isaac, which means we should have just not gone to Earth in the first place. And the League arrives at the Highland, which I believe is that Solar Battery, which now seems to be their HQ, because there's, like, the Federation is there, there's lots uh-huh. of ships now, there's a whole fleet. This We, we finally yeah. assembled a fleet, Isaac. It's getting serious now. Somebody, like, flipped a switch, and the Federation showed up. I don't know if it was Keyless Geely or the Zanuck. Do they even say why the Federation's getting involved? Oh, no, I know why. It's because they have uh, early intel right on Angel Halo. Yeah, yeah. Okay, they'll show up if they know that there's a super weapon. <laughs> <laughs> like, whoa, 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 all right, all yeah. right. <laughs> Kayla's Geely really even didn't count because it wasn't, as far as lasers go, it really wasn't on a scale enough to, to be a super weapon, I guess, you know? It's super weapon-ish, but yeah, it's not yeah. huge. It, it's, it's, we'll call it anti-fleet weapon. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, relative to what the show had before Angel Halo, it, it yeah. was a super weapon, but yeah, compared to other things not not as much no so yeah we do get to see a fleet here isaac which is kind of cool the the federation admiral he reminds me a lot of general revel he kind of even looks the same he just has a bigger absolutely. nose absolutely yeah 
His flagship is called the Jeanne d'Arc, or the Joan, I guess, Joan of Arc, basically. Of course. It's a Rock High Loom class, Isaac, though. It's basically the same ship that Bright Noah was commanding yeah. back in Charge Counterattack. This thing is old, but his is brand new. It's got a beam shield. Oh, yeah, like the beam beam sails almost. Yeah, the beam yeah. battering the ram. ram. Yeah, there you yeah. go. Uso meets his dad, who turns out to actually be the real Jin Janahanna, Janahanna, Jack Hanna. Shocking. Yeah. So how do you feel about the double switch, right? Because in part one, it was like hinted at that there was this guy named Jin Janahanna, and Uso wondered, oh, maybe that's my dad. But then we met the fake Jin Janahanna, and that kind of took the wind out of Uso's sails. But now, like, his dad really is the actual Jin Janahan. Was that a good move? Or maybe they should have just not revealed that there was another Jin until this episode and it would have meant more? Because I feel like as soon as they revealed 10 episodes ago, 15 episodes ago, that the Jin Janahan that we knew was fake, I feel like you defaulted back to, well, the real one's probably his dad. Yeah, I I just feel like it was such a weird thing to do. They wanted to be a bigger reveal or mystery. They had it down as like a concept written down when they were doing the story, but I just didn't really see much importance to it. It's There's the big reveal that he's sort of a a Federation advisor almost, slash intel guy, right? And he's, he's kind of dismissive of Uso and doesn't want him involved, I guess for obvious reasons. But, um... Yeah, it just felt like, okay, we need to add like the father mystery thing, but the the payoff wasn't worth it at all, I thought. Disappointing. Yeah, I don't think the mystery angle paid off. I mean, meeting his dad, I guess, paid off, but not necessarily the mystery angle, so I don't even know why you even do it. I mean, he Jin, or, or whatever his real name is, is it Hongurg or something, some weird name? He, he <laughs> does give Uso a hug, which is a rarity in Gundam for, for dads, so good on him. Yeah. He, he seems like one of the best dads that we have in the universal century is that fair yeah i guess so but like not fully because he's kind of dismissive of uso's abilities like in the strategy meeting about angel halo he is yeah. like even the, the other general that calls him on him he's like yeah you, you, i don't know what you're seeing but your kid's pretty sharp <laughs> <laughs> he's like this you is know? clearly because your kid's good and he's like killing everybody in front of him yeah it's like yeah uh... <laughs> what are you doing <laughs> So, Fuala flies to Tassilo's ship. This is when we first really hear a mention of Angel Angel Halo. And Tassilo says, I want Angel Halo when it's completed. And so this is going to basically lead us to the last part of the show, the last 10 episodes or show. This is like roughly episode 41 to 51. I'm just calling it, call this the fight for Angel Halo slash the end game. Oh, wait, before we get there. So, yeah, Isaac, I feel like going back to Earth was a, mis- a mistake. I feel like they should have got the mother plot done on the first go around like we could have done mother in the first half of the show and and father in the back half of the show because if the only reason we really went to earth was to do the mother thing we could have done that in part one and had less filler yeah that's really how gundam works best if you think about it like by going back to different set pieces you feel like the story isn't advancing yeah absolutely it's weird to go back to the same place over and over again it feels redundant i don't know i don't like it no no and Oh, God, just, yeah, like you said, they should have just kept the mother on Earth. Maybe even have her be the one decapitated instead of um, the Count. Oh, yeah, and yeah, he could you know. hold the, yeah, hold her head that way. That would, yeah, you'd get, you'd get there you go. double you the use out of the same head. I, 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 <laughs> exactly, I just killed two birds with one stone. I just cut <laughs> off two two heads with one guillotine. Um, so, uh, again, this, this was very much uh, not the most well-planned Gundam series. Yeah. And then you mentioned how uh, Uso's dad is dismissive of Uso, but from Uso's perspective, he's also taken aback at how different his dad is now compared to when they were in Casarelia. Mm-hmm. But I argue that Uso is just perceiving it wrong. That this this is probably how his dad was all the time, and Uso's just seeing him now as an adult rather than like as a dad. Like he's basically seeing his dad at work. Yeah, but like I don't know. I f- I felt like the the, the father edition was almost too late. It, it should have been done almost right at the start of the second half. I could see that. He did just kind of stand around a lot. He didn't really actively do too much, which is probably a mistake. At least he was uh, more useful than Tim Ray. <laughs> oh, that's true. He, he's like actually involved in their little, clearly inspired by Return of the Jedi, um, <laughs> uh, hologram super weapon attack meeting. Oh, absolutely. I'm glad you noticed that too. So when they mentioned getting back to the Angel Halo, so as Flala flies to Tesla's ship, he wants Angel Halo. 
uh, we're going to have this very Star Wars-like meeting about Angel Halo where everyone's briefed on it. They're all in one room. That was completely a ripoff of Star Wars. Absolutely. This was this yeah. was the Death Star Trench run. Not even that, but like the fact that the Queen will be on Angel Halo, like the Emperor was on the Death Star, and yeah, it's 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 all very set up to wrap up nicely if the if the good guys pull things off. <laughs> that's right, and that's how the show set itself up. Which, at least to the show's credit, at least now I knew what was happening. Right, there was a clear goal, so I'll give I'll give it that. Whereas before, we were just kind of like, right, well, we're gonna go to Earth and we're gonna go in the water, fight a dragon, and g- land on some whale bones and all this stuff. But so at this point of the show, everyone wants Angel Halo for some reason. Kagedi wants it because he created it, right? He, he wants to use it. Chronicle wants it to take Maria back from Kagedi. Tasselo wants it because he hates everyone else. And then Uso and the Federation, League Militaire, they want to destroy it. So everyone's goal at this point in the game <laughs> is to get their hands on Angel Halo. To either yeah. use it or destroy it. And the show from here on out is very linear. It's literally a line. On one end of the field, we have League Military and the Federation, and on the other end of the field is Angel Halo, and they're just going to go get it. And in their way, in order, is Pippin Eden, Tasselow, Sugan, Chronicle, and Kagedi. they got to go through everybody if they want to get Angel Halo, and that's basically what they're going to do over the next 10 episodes. And a lot of people are going to die along the way, Isaac. <laughs> <laughs> it's also clearly set up much like the end of the One Year War with the, the space fascists, once again, true to form, they're, they're all seconds from turning on each other with their own plans. They're all ready to kill each other, to try to seize the super weapon this time. They, they just can't cooperate. They're the anime Sith, just killing each <laughs> other at the drop of a hat for more power. Yeah, there were so many like double deceptions that I kind of just lost track, and I wasn't really sure if anyone on the Zanscare side was actually working together. Yeah, it also raised so many questions, because like, Tassilo, up until now, he seemed like a very by-the-book type of officer. Yep. And then to have this reveal out of nowhere was a little shocking. And then Chronicle, he was... I guess he's concerned for his sister, and he clearly rightly sees that uh, Gady's behind her manipulation, but he's kind of been along for the program too long to have not seen that. You know, Gady's been running the show for, I assume, years by now. So why why now? Yeah, I feel like Chronicle, whatever his plan was, was kind of half-baked, and it didn't really come to fruition i don't know if that was just because we didn't spend enough time with chronicle or what but he he seemed like a underdeveloped character yeah i'll somewhat amend my answer and say the appearance of a super weapon this powerful changes almost everybody because tassila's in the know about its power so he automatically thinks by seizing this he can rule the the queen uh maria she uh, commissioned this and thinks it'll help the world you know what an idiot uh, Katie knows this is a weapon to really secure power over the Earth sphere, and he'll pretty much win in one shot. Um, he doesn't really. I, I, this really explains why the Zangscare Empire really need, didn't really care too much about going toe to toe with the Federation fleets if they had this card up their sleeve. Sure. Because um, you don't need a fleet battle if you have this weapon. And then Chronicle, Mister Loyal Brother, out of nowhere, decides to turn on the government leader that he's, I assume, been in countless meetings with for years until now. Because <laughs> all of a sudden this weapon changes everything and he realizes what, what Gady really is, which uh, maybe he did at the last minute, but whatever. Everything's happening at once and we all know how it ends. They all turn on each other and try <laughs> to kill each other and all that. Yeah, so Pippin Eden and Lupe die first. Uh, Uso kills Lupe in battle and her, and either she or her spirit flies her suit back to Pippin Eden and like hugs him while he's getting ready to go out and she explodes basically in his face and uh, the dude didn't even get out of the hangar isaac he was going to take out his new mobile armor called something that we didn't even really get to see (laughs) so kind of sucks for him but oh well yeah pip and eden i would have almost believed him going evil more well they're already evil him going um coup d'etat rather than uh tassilo well, he wanted at Angel Halo too. Remember, he's like, "Wow, oh, we should take it, Lupe." And I was like, "Dude, you're not gonna get it out of all the people." <laughs> not with that hair. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was kind of a weird way for him to go. I thought we'd get more from him instead. Just a shocked look as his ugly gold mobile armor goes out, which reminds me of the mobile armor used by <sighs> that one bad guy in Double O that was like their handler. Oh man, I don't even. It was remember a that. gold teardrop shaped ugly mobile armor but whatever (laughs) pip pip the end result would have been the same because anyone in a mobile armor dies so don't you dare go out (laughs) unless you're ready to die 
Yeah, Pip wasn't going to be successful either way, I think. I mean, Lu- Lupe, Uso had a pretty good put down when he was fighting Lupe. He told her, if you want to be a mother, go bear your own child. And then he killed her. And I was like, oh, like, that's rough. And then when she died, or when she blew <laughs> up, she, <laughs> she said, that's right, boy. I don't need to be someone who associates with useless men. And then it flashed back to the bathtub scene. I still don't understand this character, Isaac. I, I honestly feel like Lupe and Pippa Needon are superfluous characters, and they should have just been deleted from the show. Yeah, maybe. And I mean, if you think about it, she's been useless. She's been with useless men for a long time, because Dan Scare is, is almost no closer to their goals. If anything, they're farther because they have to rely on Angel Halo to win. It was her thing that Uso was the only non-useless man in her life? Is that was that what she was trying to get at? I I don't know. Because he couldn't do anything in the tub? That's so, I don't that's know. So, but that's so bizarre. God, th- this show is just... Very strange. It's, it, it's a tied-up knot of nonsense at times. <laughs> so one obstacle between the League and Angel Halo has been removed, and that is the Pippin Needon fleet. Tassilo's sort of next. He's now trying to get some from Fuala. He... Oh, that was odd. That was also a turn, right, for his character. When when he shows up, you see him and Fuala. He just, like, palms her ass. <laughs> and, like, all of a sudden, he's, like, trying to get with Fuala. That was weird. That that wasn't, yeah. like, in part one. I didn't get that vibe from them at all. No, especially that, that dinner they had where, like, he told her you're going to be executed. Yeah, I that was very her, odd. Like, it was so professional, almost and cold. And now they're like, ah, well, we're going to do a little coup and rule the government. So let's just get Randy here on the bridge. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, what's uh, uh, Zanskar's discipline and cohesion was breaking down the closer Angel Halo got to launching, <laughs> like by the minute. Again, just another strange thing in this show. It's also the young people. If you notice, like, Gady and, and Sugar, or Sugan, they were towing the line. Yeah, that's true. They're still on the same plan they've had probably for years to take over the Earth sphere. Yeah, yeah, because Gady's just sitting there like, I'm just waiting to use this Angel Halo thing, guys. Like, what are you all doing? You're supposed to be guarding yeah. the base. <laughs> but, like, they just can't do it. Yeah, Sugan's their admiral, I guess, the, the Gady's right-hand admiral, and he's... He's still trying to fight and do admiral stuff, but man, this is ma- they're making it hard. <laughs> With age comes calmness, apparently. Yeah, you're like, oh, these damn kids, they just want to, they think they can take over the government in like one day. <laughs> Everyone's just hooking up with everybody and betraying everybody. Yeah, just, just these lap dances on the bridge. What's going on? <laughs> I leave for five minutes and look, everything's collapsing. <laughs> <laughs> Someone bit her boob. What oh, is yeah. going on? <laughs> So Fuala goes out. Uso destroys the Xanic. It was a good fight, though. That was one of the better fights in the show. But Fuala does escape. And that was actually a mistake. I think that uh, Fuala should have died in the Xanic. Yeah. I think everything after that with Fuala was not as cool as the Xanic. No. It should have been her kind of last stand, right? Because she had, right. in, in some ways, she was somewhat of a longer term villain than almost anybody else in the show. That's right. That's right. I know Chronicle was there kind of from the beginning, but hear me out. Chronicle had some kind of good guy points to him, right? Because, right. yeah. but but uh, we're, we're kind of past that now. But yeah, she, she did most of the heavy lifting as like the one constant villain. Yeah, I would say in the back half, she's one of the bigger villains. She was one among many in, as of part one. And then when you, when you look at the show as a whole, she's probably right below Chronicle and Katagina uh-huh. by the end of the show in terms of your antagonist who, who actually pilots a mobile suit. Yeah, but again, we suffered from the writing. She should have had maybe the best final mobile suit battle, but she was robbed. Unfortunate. So the Xanic goes down. We're going to see her her new suit here in a bit, but it's definitely not as cool as the Xanic. Plus, if you're going to replace the Xanic, you got to do it with something cooler, and, and her replacement wasn't as cool as the Xanic, so... Probably one of the most interesting facts we got in the back half here, Isaac, is the Fed General, or Fed Admiral, I believe, is his name Mubarak, I think, or Moop, something like that, right? I don't know. It was... Are we talking about a guy that looks like Revel? Yeah, yeah. It's General Neville. <laughs> General <laughs> Neville. Mubarak Starn is his name. Oh, boy. That's a rough one. Yeah, right. I don't even think I said Starn in the show, but that's what it says in the wiki. But yeah... <laughs> So he wonders, which was a great question. He's sitting there at his little table and he's like, why didn't we see this angel halo thing before being built? And I was in my mind, I was like, great question. I always ask that. Finally, uh, yeah, a reasonable question, right? (laughs) Right. What were you guys doing on the sensors? 
This is a question that asks for every super weapon that ends up in the Earth's sphere. Like, what the hell happened? How did they build a laser this big? That's right. That's right. And Uso actually comes up with the answer, Isaac, because he wonders if it's because the transports from Jupiter brought the pieces. And Mubarak is like, wow, that kid's probably right. Because Kagedi did come from Jupiter, and apparently his party was responsible for collecting the helium-3 supply as their government restructured into the Jupiter Republic Alliance. Uh, which I really like because it totally reframes Angel Halo as a Jupiter weapon, basically. Yeah. Or, you know, something from Jupiter. And given everything we've read about Crossbone, that fits right in with the Jupiter MO. It's also sort of a, I mean, if you're if you're counting in, well, there's no way you shouldn't count it in as canon, but Crossbone, the manga series, is canon, and Skull Heart is canon. This does not bode well for, what, what was the princess's name? Oh, Bernadette. <laughs> this does not bode well for Bernadette as the government leader. Wait, what did she end up being the government leader for Jupiter? No, she went to Earth to live her happy, happy ever after, right? Uh, well, she came back after uh, Steel Seven, so we haven't seen what happens to her yet after Steel Seven. But uh, there is the, okay. the sequel that we haven't read yet does take place at the same time as Victor Gundam, and uh, okay, we do see uh, Mister Kagadi, I believe, does make a. Uh, an appearance so we will we well, will see them again she's clearly not doing a good job <laughs> if they're shipping super, super weapons and parts like they were just you know delivered by amazon over to the earth sphere <laughs> to be assembled and and turned into a weapon that can kill countless people man if you re if you reframe <laughs> jupiter as like amazon that is a little frightening now i'm a little frightened of amazon <laughs> the evil megacorp yeah, yeah who just <laughs> controls the shipping lane for all the powerful products. Oh, makes sense. Makes sense. Oh, there you yeah. Go. So Shakti has another bad idea. Now she wants to go talk to Chronicle to see if she could, you know, stop Angel Halo somehow. So they take her to Angel Halo somehow. I don't know how. Because remember, the whole point was we were trying to get to Angel Halo, but then they just, like, take her to Angel Halo earlier. So that's kind of strange. At Angel Halo, we see Kagadi clearly manipulating Maria. She believes that this is just going to make everyone not want to fight anymore and not really hurt anyone. And he's like, oh, yeah, we'll just spread our peace. And, I mean, Kagedi looks evil, right, Isaac? There's no way you should trust that guy. <laughs> she is one of the dumbest people I've ever seen in Gundam. She is. Just how she's let this get so far, how naive she is. Yeah, she's way too gullible. It is ridiculous. Almost as ridiculous as those, like, high-level guards slash assistants that are in the wigs. <laughs> oh, yeah, those guys are weird. What were they called? They were called, like, her something guard, right? Not royal guard, but something like that. Yeah, whatever. Ugh. <laughs> so Kagedi turns on Angel Halo with Maria inside of it. And I guess we should talk about Angel Halo briefly. Angel Halo is a Psychomu fortress, is what the wiki calls it. And uh, basically it's controlled by one new type in the center in like the control, I'll call it the control ship, I guess. They call it the key room in the show, but it's basically a control ship. And it's powered by these, I think in the show they say there's 20,000 human batteries, which are called psychicers, that are sort of amplifying all the you know psycho waves that the one new type is then focusing and controlling to do whatever that new type wants to do. In this case, she is telling everyone to stop fighting and instead to think of happy, peaceful memories. And what's happening is it's causing people to fall asleep and basically that mental state that they go into is going to start causing like mass cellular degeneration and, and basically they're going to die or, or their mental capacity is going to be basically ruined quite a debilitating weapon really isaac i mean there's not a whole lot of defense against this thing no it's a little abstract too as far as gundam weapons which are usually like a big burst of energy you know a big right. wave of energy a beam of energy whatever uh this is just so literally a cerebral type weapon it's it's different i'll give it that i'm not sure if it has a big um finale type of fireworks show though that we're normally used to it's definitely a, a more weaponized take on new types which i think is okay i do wish it was in a little less wacky of a show or or just a little more well put together show i think it could have had a better showing um but it, it is still in principle a very debilitating weapon so they turn this thing on and it starts affecting people on the battlefield, particularly Uso. He's trapped sort of between illusions and reality, and he's fading back and forth, and it's basically putting him in mortal danger because he can't really tell fact from fiction on the battlefield. Odello does snap him out of it, though, along with his memories of, like, the Shrike team dying of all things, which is pretty disturbing. At this point, Uso gets the Buster upgrade, which is, like, some more guns for the, v for the V2. He duels Fuala, who's in her new green suit, 
Tassilo takes Maria hostage and his coup begins. He tells Maria the truth about the people degrading from being used by Angel Halo or being affected by Angel Halo. And Maria's like, what do you mean? Kagadi said it would be okay. And then <laughs> Tassilo's <laughs> like, would you really believe that guy? Look at him. In terms of Kagadi, though, Isaac, to my point, he, he does look like an evil guy, right? But I feel like in you, you can read what he's done that's evil on the wiki. But I feel like in the show, we really haven't seen him do anything that evil. No, you just sort of know that he's behind the war. He's the real leader of the government. And by default of being behind the war, he's, he's a bad guy. Uh, the very vague details, though, it could have been done better. If we could lose some other characters and give us more background on him, I think that would be that would have been better. At least, you know, like in, in 0079, you think of, okay, we didn't get a whole lot about every single Zombie member, but what we did was very informative. By the end, you knew that Degwin was waffling. He didn't really want to go down the complete Giran path. No. You, you could tell that Giran was a complete psycho. You know, you could feel the bloodlust that Cassilia had. You got a good sense of who Dolza was. I feel like you don't have that here for Kagadi, and that kind of holds him back as being a, a huge villain. Maybe you just don't need so many people. I mean, you don't need Pip, you don't need Taslo, Kagadi, and Sugin, maybe you just need two of them. You know, I don't know. Yeah, I would have liked more background on him, but there's no way that would have happened with how the story was done. And I'm not surprised at all that he's just such a vague figure that that we know he's bad because he looks bad. <laughs> is what it really boils down to. And that we're told he's bad. It's also another disappointment because if I think about the times that Jupiter was used in the animated series, it was always very intriguing. Right in 0079, we had Shalia Bull, the man from Jupiter. Didn't get a whole lot about Shalia Bull, but he seemed very intriguing. Zeta Gundam, you had Paptimus. He was very intriguing, but you didn't get a whole show about Jupiter. Here was your another opportunity to give a lot more about Jupiter, and he didn't really do it. You get the one thing that Uso talks about, but he's not even from Jupiter. Kind of want to hear the Jupiter stuff from Kagadi. Again, missed opportunity. Definitely. Could have had like a cool like final speech, like where he lays everything out and calls Maria stupid and <laughs> you know how how Jupiter's always wanted to do this to Earth and you know, now's their chance and they're finally gonna be able to do it and there's nothing that can be done to stop them. <clears throat> so the people of Earth are starting to fall asleep, their decay is starting. <laughs> and and the elephants too, apparently. <laughs> we already have so few. <laughs> yeah, they're already endangered, yeah. Isaac. <laughs> And this problem is going to get worse, apparently, if Angel Halo lands. So the next step of this is they're going to direct Angel Halo to <laughs> land on Earth. Which would be impressive, because, like, how can something made of moving rings land, you know? <laughs> you just move it in. I don't know. But who am I to say? Because I assume the moment it'll land, it'll start going over, like, a, a unicycle over the land. <laughs> you know, just like everything else that the Zanskar have designed. <laughs> yeah, what if they put wheels on it? It is a wheel. It's multiple That's wheels. That's true. <laughs> just rolls on its own side. Yeah. Uh, Fuala is about to kill Marbit, and she feels the baby inside Marbit and stops. She hesitates. Uso capitalizes on this moment, kills Fuala, so Fuala is finally out of the picture. Again, I think a little bit too late. Shakti's now praying in Angel Halo. You know, Tassilo took Maria, obviously. She's no longer in there. Shakti had gone in there to try to convince them to stop doing it, and Chronic was like, no, we're, you're going to need to use Angel Halo if you want to do this. But Shakti thinks she's praying to the battlefield for people to stop. She's actually directing her stuff to Earth, which is, like, making it worse. And so Uso's, like, frantically trying to get to Shakti. He's battling his way to Tassilo. At this point, he's in, like, full ace mode now, Isaac. He's just, like, killing everybody. Finally using the wings of light, kind of probably the way he should. Mm -hmm. But as Uso finds Maria and Tassilo, he does get in there. I think he's on Tassilo's bridge, right, or something? Yeah, I think so. Maria asks Uso to kill her. She wants to stop this. But Uso doesn't want to do it because that's Shakti's mom. And Tassilo just straight up murders Maria right in front of Uso. She sh he shoots her like three times through the chest. <laughs> that was pretty brutal. I mean, it defeats the whole point of wanting to kidnap the queen. It does. I was a little confused what, what his plan was there. Was it just because she left him no choice and he thought that would help him get out of the situation? Or what, why do you think he killed her? He had almost gone insane by this point. Just this maddening plan to just storm Angel Halo, 
seize the queen and try to rule the earth sphere himself. I think he figured without her, he still had angel halo, even though he really didn't. Yeah. And he could, he could pull it off anyways. So she was just extra baggage. She was dead weight. Maybe he thought that Uso was going to kill him anyway. And so he might as well take Maria from him. I don't know. Sure. (laughs) Poor writing. So anyway, as retribution, Uso kills Tassilo by lighting up his beam saber, basically at point blank range. And Tassilo's not in a mobile suit. Uso just holds up the beam saber and lights him up. That's pretty brutal, Isaac. I don't think we've ever seen that. Yeah, it was... No, actually, a a beam saber kill is pretty rare. Especially a double kill. (laughs) Yeah. Just, like, vaporized him. Yeah. Turn it on and off real quick. It's all you needed. Doesn't Fuala go in the same one? Or... Uh, I think she was already dead at that point. She jumped in it in a spacesuit, I think, or something like that. Oh, uh, maybe. Or... Yeah, I don't remember. A suit, and then I think it flicked towards her or something. Oh, no, that was um, that team of women. Oh. That, that were, like, using the RPGs to, like... Oh, yeah, inter- I didn't even... Yeah. I, none of, they didn't even make it into my summary, but that's, like, the... You're talking about the Bikini Squadron, right? Yeah, that was ridiculous. <laughs> it's like, whoa, you'll distract them like this. See, th- this show just had, like... The dumbest idea of fan service, you know, it, it just detracted from the story. Like, I don't even want to talk about that. That was just such stupidity slash callback to Char using a rocket in the final base. <laughs> so funny story about the Bikini Squadron, Isaac. The first time I saw them, I had actually fallen asleep and that was the part I woke up at, but they were like already you know, in the scene. Like I had skipped the intro and that was what I saw when I woke up and I was like, well, I, what did I miss? Like what, what the hell's going on? Like I have to really rewatch this episode now because I don't know what's going on. Well, they didn't last long, Brian. <laughs> no, they did not. So at this point, uh, Tassel is dead. Fual is dead. Maria is dead. V2 gets the assault upgrade now, which is basically extra armor. Um, The psychicers are dying as people start shooting Angel Halo because Angel Halo is full of all these the psychicers or the human batteries. They're lining the walls of these of this thing because Angel Halo. I guess we should talk about its appearance, Isaac. You did mention it's a bunch of rings. It's a bunch of concentric rings that are sometimes the rings are different angles. So like one layer of the ring may be a different angle than the one inside it and so on and so forth. So the the actual appearance I thought was pretty cool. Yeah. But it's 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 a weird weapon in the sense, Isaac, that to your point, it's not a giant beam. There's not uh-huh. a lot of defense on it. It's literally, it's like a transport ship, essentially. It's just got people in it. It's really like the Death Star, if you think about it. Like, it needs a fleet nearby to kind of protect it. Sure, it's got like maybe a couple guns or something, but not really. <laughs> yeah, it, it's just kind of a sitting duck. And so when it does get hit, What's getting hit are the people inside, and they're basically flying out, dying, and they're all basically in some sort of, would you say, like, cryo sleep or stasis? Yeah, I, I think Uso or somebody in passing, I think it was Chronicle, said, oh, these people are all, like, brainwashed, you yeah. know, so they're, like, brainwashed and then put into these tubes in a hypnotic state or something, I don't know why they have to be in tubes, but <laughs> yeah, their their psychic energy, I guess, is just being fed to Maria to amplify or whoever's in the yeah. cockpit because Shakti was in there too. <laughs> it's very bizarre and we've never really seen new type dynamics kind of work like this where somebody's like your battery if they're a new type and you're a new type. So it was all very new. It's a, it's a much harder sci-fi take on the, new, on the new type thing. I feel like this is something you'd see in like an Outer Limits episode. Yeah, I wouldn't even say it's harder. I'd say it's more just uh, almost bizarre. <laughs> Fantastical where like, you know, oh, my psychic power grows by the presence of other psychics. It's like, uh, okay, sure. This is a little tropey. <laughs> One thing that I don't think did Angel Halo any favors is I don't think the art style of this show lended itself well to visualizing Angel Halo. If this show had a, a style more akin to like Akira ah, or something like that, I feel like it could be visually very neat. Right. Yeah, I can see that completely. It would be more... Um, <sighs> the seriousness of the situation did not lend itself to the uh, more rounded, cartoony Simple design. shapes, simple yeah. colors. Yeah. This needs a much harder tech appearance and then i think it could have looked pretty cool like if you had animated this with like you know the unicorn team Mm -hmm. i think it would look a lot different but this was par for the course for such a bizarre series yeah so the end of the psychicers are falling off they're they're dying shakti's trying to wake them up at this point that's their her whole goal is to save the innocent psychicers inside sort of going okay but not really 
Kagadi sends Angel Halo down to Earth. We're going back to Earth again, Isaac. This series has a people going to and fro the same place multiple times in a, in a battle problem. I feel like we get taxied to and fro Angel Halo too many times in the middle of this battle when the whole point was to get to Angel Halo. Like, if the whole point is to get there, but how can you go there three, four times while you're trying to do that? Right. If it's that easy to get there, then just go do it. Why is it taking everyone else so long? Yeah. This, this is in direct contrast to something like solomon or about coup where you had to fight like hell to get there and risk everything and when you got there you weren't going back it's not just a happy jaunt or a hop skip and a jump away what i i just don't understand if they did less back and forth you know they would have gotten angel halo while it was under construction <laughs> someone would have checked that amazon package <laughs> see that makes me wonder like was this what they wanted for the final weapon or is this another product of executive meddling slash designed by committee because i i just don't know i think this one seems like something that tomino came up with i just think that the execution up to that point was very haphazard and that's what we get i still feel like something was missing with angel halo it could have been a better final super weapon but we never really got there did you say that it feels from another anime series Hmm. no i think well i said it was like a harder sci-fi Okay. To me, it does feel like an ultimate new type weapon or a concept that could could be that ultimate new type weapon. I'd almost say the new type weapon would instead do like mind control or something. You know, this is making people turn infantile. It's, it sounds like such a an abstract way to take out people. Yeah, I mean, I guess their goal was to take the earth from them. So maybe if their goal had been something else, maybe then they would have done the mind control. Because I feel like mind control would be within reason for Angel Halo, but... Yeah, exactly. But, uh... To your point, maybe we didn't get to see the consequences of it enough. Because to our knowledge, I don't know that the people who fell asleep on Earth, I don't know that they ultimately died, right? I assume not. I assume once it was blown up, they all woke up and yeah. rubbed their eyes. You know, the elephants very, got um, up and went back to the yeah, watering hole. <laughs> very sleeping beauty, you know? <laughs> That's pretty much what it was. <laughs> so maybe maybe there should have been an episode where it just wipes out millions of people. Sure, I would have I, I would have felt its gravity more than that. Yeah, if more yeah. if that happened. And maybe it should have been where with like Maria doing it, she thinks they're yeah. going to sleep, and what they're actually doing is just flat out dying. Yeah, there you go. She's so naive. And then maybe she tries to kill herself somehow because she's so distraught. Like I, I feel like that would there be you go. better than whatever it was yeah you know, happened right i like that already i like that even better brian very nice i don't know what these people were doing wasn't that hard <laughs> no apparently not and god what a what a bizarre end to the show what a bizarre final weapon yeah very strange so angel halo's on earth now the Jean d'arc kamikazes into the sugan fleet by the admiral because it got damaged by a, a katagina like beam blast but Chronicle swoops in and blows up the bridge first before it can actually do its kamikaze. So now it's just kind of flying slowly toward the Sugan fleet, Isaac. There's a bit of a disappointing end for Admiral Mubarak. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to come back. but Yeah, but um, man, that Sugan fleet, they're, they're not doing well. <laughs> no, no. At this point, Shakti sings in Angel Halo. She starts singing that red poppy song, Isaac. That sets Katagina off because Katagina hates nice things. She can't have them. As a result, uh, she starts shooting at the tires. She calls them Kagedi's damn tires. One of the strike team, I think it's uh, Franny or Muriellia, one of them, thinks that Katagina is going to defect. She goes over to check on her. Katagina kills Franny and then Mur- Muriellia. So two more strike team members down, just in cold blood by Katagina who's now piloting a new pink suit, which was pretty cool relative to the other, you know, the rest of the designs in the show. Quite a powerful suit compared to everything else we've seen. Chronicle's also in a new suit, the Rig Contio. It's like bullhorns. That was a weird decision, right? Yeah, especially since the, all the other suits are very bug-like. This was, I don't know, it'd be like a Spain suit in G-Gun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just needed like a little, what do they call the, it's not a cape, but whatever they you know, wave. Whatever, the yeah, the, the anti-bull towel. <laughs> <laughs> Chronicle mortally wounds the the reinforce. Everyone evacuates, but the geezers, all the old people, they decide to kamikaze the reinforce. They turn on the beam shield and they ram it into the fleet, taking out a, a bunch of Zanskar ships in the explosion. 
Uso and Chronicle Duel, Connie, who's I think the last Strike Team member remaining, other than, unless you want to count Marbit. Um, she tries to interrupt, but Katagina murders her for interfering. So the entire Strike Team dies, Isaac. There are zero survivors, which I guess is not super surprising, but Connie did live pretty long. She was the last one left, and she was with us since part one. Well, that's Tamino for this depressive era Gundam. And then uh, all of a sudden, the Jean d'Arc flies in and takes out Sugan Squid. So Sugan ends up dying, Isaac. And I think right before that, Kagedi died too, right? Or right after? He like he evacuated from Sugan's ship in a little escape pod ship type thing. But then he ended up, did he die right in the evacuation? Did he like hit something? Or what happened to him? I mean, he died, but I don't yeah, remember I'm how. Tr- I'm trying to remember. I remember him leaving in the opposite direction of Sugan. Right. who like takes a, a blast to the bridge, right? Or the ram to the bridge. Right, Sugan gets the John Dark to the face. Okay. And then I feel shortly after that, Kagedi dies. But it wasn't, in a, it wasn't a notable death for Kagedi, I feel. No, I, I'm trying to remember what happened to him. I don't even think he says anything. I think it's just beam blast or something, right? Yeah, I feel like it was a, maybe he goes in a beam saber. I don't know. But yeah, Kagedi's dead too at this point. That's bothering me. I'm going to have to watch it. Shakti wakes up the psychicers, the rings start breaking apart. Katagina kills Odello, which was one of the more shocking deaths at the end, Isaac. I thought Odello was going to make it. He'd been with us for a long time. The strangest part about that, Isaac, was that, you know, Odello and Tomas, they, they had been together for a long time. Tomas was shockingly absent while Katagina was fighting Odello. And we don't see him the entire rest of the show. So he's, he's not dead because we didn't see him die, but he was, just wasn't there. He wasn't helping Odello. So way to go, Tomas. You got Odello killed in my book. <laughs> oh, God. Odello, I thought, would make it. You know, he was fairly competent. Well, there's one time where he got very gung-ho, right? But Yeah, and he was young enough that I thought he might be off limits for Tomino to kill, but... No, apparently not. Not so. <laughs> Only that baby. <laughs> Carlman, yeah. Carlman lives, thank God. In Flanders. He didn't dare didn't kill the dog. Uh, Uso duels Chronicle in their final fight, which was a good fight. And then uh, Uso finally overtakes him. And Chronicle actually has a really brutal death, Isaac. He gets flung out of his suit, and he sees Maria, and he asks her to help him. And then his head collides with a ring section, killing him instantly. Well, that sounds like a good way for a shark clone to go out. (laughs) Uh, So then the final duel is a knockdown dragout duel between Uso and Katagina. At one point, Isaac, she gets out and, you know, says, you two were always mocking me, looking down on me. And then she stabs him, Isaac. She was, like, lying. And she stabs Uso in the side with a knife. I hate this woman so much. So, so much. Well, you're going to love what we see happens to her at the end. (laughs) (laughs) But Uso does best her with the wings of light. She doesn't die, to Isaac's point. She does show up again at the end. She's blind and has no memories. So things didn't turn out well for her. She's sort of a broken woman. She doesn't remember Shakti. She doesn't remember Uso. See, that's confusing. So the wings of light can, like, give off a blast that blinds you? Is that what I'm to understand? I I, I don't think they made it super clear why she was blind. I just assumed that she was blinded by some sort of explosion. Okay, well... Angel Halo didn't really explode so much as, like, disassemble via new type powers and, like, reconfigure and float away. That's true. I I was assuming it was something to do with her suit, you know, because her suit did take a lot of damage. So presumably there was some sort of explosion by her suit or or very near it. Uh And she, I assume, got her head bumped. Or maybe she got blind not from a a light source, but maybe she hit her head too hard and her her retinal uh, nerves disconnected. I guess we'll never know, but man, what a what a vague way to take someone out and then you bring them back after the fact. Right, and I guess we'll just wrap it up here. So Uso catches Shakti and whoever's still alive, they all go home to Casarelia. Marbet, Uso, Shakti, they all live in Casarelia. Martina's alive. Elisha's, Elisha's, Elisha, however you say her name, she's alive. Presumably Tomas is alive. Uh, Flanders, Carmen, Warren is alive, so I guess he gets to be with Martina. Katagina comes through, and I thought it was interesting, Isaac, that Shakti doesn't tell anyone that Katagina comes through, right? She doesn't show Katagina to anyone else. Maybe she thinks that she's the only one who could deal with Katagina. Everyone else would be too mad at her. Or she just had so much pity for her, it seemed, you know, the way right. she reacted when she left. And I wonder how Uso would have reacted, you know? I don't know. I think it's a good thing to keep that woman away from Uso, though. Yeah. That woman has a hold over Uso for whatever reason. 
and it's not good. Right. I kind of feel like part of me wants to believe he would have forgiven her. Probably, because Uso's a nice guy. We'll never know. But man, I hate, I hate that woman. Oh, and so the one thing about the end, Isaac, that was unclear to me, which I did look up, after the Jean d'Arc is evacuated, or not evacuated, but after they decide to go on the kamikaze, the Admiral looks over and Uso's dad has, has left. And he's like, oh, you're a smart guy, Jin. And we never see Jin the rest of the story. He's not even in the end. But he didn't die. It turns out he's in the Crossbone manga. He continued fighting after the fact to go focus on the next threat. Hmm. So Uso's dad survived, but he doesn't go live with him in, in Casa Aurelia. So it's a very uh, weird relationship. Yeah, left to go focus on the next threat. Yeah, very job book. Maybe he doesn't want to deal with all the loss, losing his wife, and I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I haven't read it, so maybe those of you out there who have read it, he, maybe he does imply that he has contact with Uso. I mean, I assume he does, right? He wouldn't just, like, not talk to him anymore, but kind of a weird person to not include in the epilogue, I think, right? Yeah, definitely. Very, um, I don't know. Like a, like a secret agent. <laughs> right, yeah. Very strange. The other thing that I thought was notable is we do see the victory and the victory 2 in Casarelia at the end. Uso and Marbet are keeping him there, basically, just in case things go wrong and they need him again one day. That's very much in contrast to other shows where we don't really know what happens to the Gundams sometimes. If you think about it, we don't know what what happened to the Zeta Gundam. Now that you mention it, I guess we don't. There nope. must be a side story. <laughs> no, it's it, it's a unresolved plot point. Oh, wow. No one knows where the Zeta Gundam is. Huh. Or the Hyakushiki, I believe. Hmm. Double Zeta, we know. Judah took that with her. Okay. Arc 78, we know that it got destroyed. New Gundam... We know what happened there. Sazabi's on Axis. Unicorn, we know that's sealed away. But the Zeta Gundam, we don't know. Hmm. The ones we do know what happened to them, they, they sort of have a more definitive fate where they were destroyed or something like that. But the V2, very, very powerful Gundam, is just sitting in the forest in Eastern Europe. I wouldn't even say sitting. Yeah, d- d- decaying almost. There's like overgrowth on right, it. Right, right. It turned into junk like I wish this series was in my mind because <laughs> it was just a bizarre, disappointing series, Brian. I, I don't know what else to say. Didn't stick to landing. Wish it did. And man, I feel like a broken record because I just <laughs> didn't stick to landing. This was just, it had so much promise and it didn't end up delivering. And it, it's a tragedy really because it had a lot of interesting characters, interesting plot elements, the super weapon. I'm, I'm not fully down with Angel Halo, but it, it's kind of a start. I think, I think it's half baked, but I just feel such a, a bizarre kind of feeling after finishing the series and not, and not enjoying it at all. Well, not, not at all, but mostly. I can definitely say I enjoyed parts of the series. Did I enjoy the series as a whole? That's a that's a hard question. I think the answer is generally no, because there was more time when I wasn't enjoying it than I was enjoying it. Yeah. Right? And so, right. so whatever I said earlier, 15 episodes that are good, I don't think those can outweigh the other 35 that were bad. I also think it makes it really in- inaccessible. Isaac, I don't know who's going to be able to watch this whole show. Yeah. You know, Tomino did say don't watch it. So I guess we're the fools for disobeying his uh, his directions. I guess so, but like, hmm. I'm trying to think if there's anything redeeming about the show. I mean, I think it had some good designs. I personally think the, the V2 Gundam is a great design. Just the base model, I think, is very simple. It's very elegant. I think it's one of the better Gundam designs that there are. I wish the show was better, <laughs> but I really do like the, the V2 design. Yeah. The fully upgraded version, the Assault and the Buster. It's pretty cool when you look at the model kit. I think the line art suffers a little bit. In the show, it was neat. It, it's definitely very 90s looking, but if you like those kind of things, I think it's a good design. What did you think of the Gun Blaster, Isaac? I feel like you would like that design. See, it was okay. They felt very much like the Flints. Yep. And I liked how they looked. Not because they were like super sinister or anything, but they looked like a good kind of mid-range, well-equipped you know, assault heavy, precise targeting uh, mobile suit. Yeah. And I, I thought they were a pretty cool design. That might, maybe the only one on the Lee Militaire side that was interesting. But that said, I still feel like I'd rather get a Xanic. <laughs> and uh, before the Xanic, I'd rather get even like a high mobility Zaku sure, or something yeah, yeah. from like Southern, for, for the Southern Cross squad. But I, uh, w- w- let me ask you a question, Brian. Do you feel like this series is a missed opportunity, lost opportunity? Uh, both, probably. Okay, yeah, because 
God, the more I'm thinking about it, we had this cool religious angle with the queen. We, we've reached almost a point in the UC where it seems like new type abilities have gotten stronger. She can heal people, the whole bizarre bell thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> what else? The angel halo itself. And this, this is like peak new type abilities. Well, we, it's sort of, but, but then again, the entire show had no funnels and no bits. Yeah, which is bizarre. It's very odd, right? Like the victory too is very strong, but it doesn't have any bits. Was that an animation choice? Just like they simplified the animation, they knew like the complexity of animating funnels, keeping track of where they were would be too much. I don't know. Maybe there was just a the decision to not go down that direction after a certain year in the Universal Century. Because remember, in in F nine one, we noted the same thing. There were no funnels there either. If someone knows the answer why there are no funnels after the UC 120s, I would be interested mm. to know. Because to your point, Angel <laughs> Halo, is that the ultimate new type weapon? I mean, funnels and bits are synonymous with new types. So I'll boil my, my statements down even further and go to the characters. Because Uso, as a very young character being in war, would have been such an interesting take. I know it's always like a teenager thrown into the cockpit. But what was different about this series was it starts with him in the cockpit. Um, <laughs> he's not really thrown into it. And it just seems like his arc over the series was really just loss after loss. Um, very traumatic yeah. losses. I don't really get the sense that he grew in the same way that like Amuro did or many of our other characters. Even Hero, who starts off as like a stone cold soldier and really opens up his heart. But in, in Uso's case, he was already on the side he should have been and fully behind it and on episode zero before the credits even rolled. So there was no arc, just him advancing along this plot. And I fully agree with him. You know, this series, it's not enjoyable. Don't watch it. <laughs> and I should have rewatched something else. I should have seen <laughs> Iron-Blooded Orphans again or something. <laughs> or switch to Victory. Or I'm sorry, Zeta or something. <laughs> I think to your point, the concept of the show was was fine. There's if you boil the show down to like a high level, like what is the conflict, mm -hmm. right? Of like Earth is in tatters, the Federation is going down. You know, there's a, a new upstart colony that's trying to start some stuff, and their opponent is a depleted Federation. So they're really only dealing with this essentially, you know, grassroots organization on Earth who wants to defend it. There's nothing wrong with that premise. So therefore, I think it's a problem of execution. And we know why the execution was bad. Tamina was depressed. He didn't want to do the show. They made him do the show anyway. And they made him put stuff in the show he didn't want to put in the show. Another thing that killed the show, Isaac, I think, is they ordered 51 episodes. Yeah. Right? If they had ordered less episodes, maybe we wouldn't have so much stuff that doesn't matter. They, they had no idea what to do, so they had us go back to Earth, then back to space. This yeah. is what happens when you put, I need 50 episodes of Gundam. I don't care how good it is, but I need that. Go give it right, to me. Right, yeah. Put all these characters in it. We're going to kill them all off. You know, one, one's going to die every three episodes. Right. So I think it's definitely a missed opportunity given that it now leaves a weird spot in the Universal Century timeline where I feel like while there's plenty of stuff in this timeline related to the Crossbone manga, I feel like they're going to be very hesitant to touch it with animation anytime soon. Yeah, I don't want them to put any time into this to expand it. I don't want them to make more uh, master grade models from it. Let's just kind of leave it in the past, skip over it to something else in the UC or right before. I mean, Uso is still pretty young. You could make a sequel with him. Oh, God. Well, not against Zanscare, though. No, no. Zanscare is... Well, uh, that's a good question for you. I got the sense. Remember there was that one ship left sort of like near the end? Where they were like, oh, maybe we'll barely make it back to uh, the colony with our ship in this condition. It was a Zanscare ship. In my mind, uh -huh. I was like, are you the last Zanscare ship? Are they all gone? <laughs> uh, maybe an even more important question. The colony? Are, is there is Zanscare down to one colony? Well, they you know? they have their one main colony, right? And then the other ones are, I'm sure they have some under their influence. But you know, I'm talking about the one like where the Queen Maria's palace was. But like I got the sense that Zanscare had been mostly defeated in that last battle. I feel like they had basically everyone that they had was there. Right, yeah. They made a big deal about Sugan's fleet, and they needed the, the Tassilo fleet. All fleets are now done. 
Yeah, the Federation, to their credit, when they had to mop the floor with somebody, they mopped the floor they with somebody. They steamrolled them. Yeah, it very seemed like that was it. Their, their leadership's gone, so we can assume that their smaller fleets were gone too. Yeah. So I hope that's it for Zanskare, because uh, if you're a Zanskare fan, reach out, because I, <laughs> I don't see any Zanskare fans anywhere. <laughs> people who like Zeon, people who look at them don't think, oh, they love Zeon because they're a fascist. I feel like if you liked Zanscare, there's no reason for you to like Zanscare unless you really are yeah, really into person. like, you know, hurting people basically. So Yeah. They were a bland form of like the space fascists, right? Zeon's got like zest and, you know, everyone <laughs> kind of goes along with how campy Zeon is. But Zanscare right. was just this boring kind of bizarre, half religious, wig wearing, boring version of evil. And maybe that's where they could have used some of the some of that Jupiter craziness to shade it a little bit, give it a little bit more color. But you know, again, we didn't get that. Yeah, Dogati, we really, I would have really liked a more inside look at his speech or his his goals and stuff like that, and like a speech. But um, we we were robbed of Dogati. Right, we didn't even get a speech from uh, Kagati. No, there's almost always the I am evil speech, right, that a villain yeah. does. But Dogeti was just, he, he gave that speech years ago to, to probably to Shugan, you know, when they were having lunch, <laughs> going over their plans. I like that you're calling him Dogeti, by the way. Oh, whoops, Kagati. <laughs> or Gady, sorry. Was that a, uh, for, for not Freudian slip, but you know what it's I mean. It's a J- Jupiter slip. There it's you go. <laughs> wishing that uh, the other antagonist was here. Right, but he's he's long dead by now, unfortunately. Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> so Gady, I assume, took the name in his honor? Can't be his real name. Yeah, that we, we talked about that in the last one. They they did meet in one of the Crossbone Gundam mangas, oh. but other than being uh, other than being from Jupiter, it doesn't seem that they are okay related. But they just have very similar names, and they actually look very similar too, if you think about it. Kagadi and Dogadi. So okay, it'd be like the equivalent of someone's last name being Neil, or and then or O'Neil. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe okay. Gadi is a common Jupiter. It's Smith and Jupiter. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, one last question for you, Isaac. Who do you hate more? Oh, wow. Katagina Luce or Quest Pariah? Wow. I have to go with Katagina. Quest. <laughs> you still hate Quest more. I still do. And let me explain why. Katagina, as bad as she was, she was not a whiny person. She was a very much a gung-ho committed soldier for the Zanscare cause, which is not my favorite villain faction. I don't care for them, clearly. But uh, she was what she was. Quest, on the other hand, was just such this bizarre, shoehorned-in girl to the story that was like, you had this ickiness going on with her and Char. And then, <laughs> well, that's more on Char's side, not really hers. But... um. And then she's she's a pilot that's really annoying. Uh, Katagina on the other side was just a very much became a stone cold killer, mm, which I okay. which I have more respect for than Quest. So yes, Quest okay. is more annoying. It's the whininess and the ickiness. Back me up, listeners. Quest or Katagina? See, I'm voting Katagina. I think she's got no redeeming qualities. I think she's just you hate her more. Oh, absolutely. Great A, <laughs> just completely irredeemable. She's a good pilot. She is a very good pilot. I'll give that to her. I, I could not wait for someone to kill her. Well, it never happened. In the sequel, she'll probably get her eyesight back. Oh, God. <laughs> Please, no. But she, but she switches sides and teams up with Uso. Oh, there they go. She killed a whole bunch of our, our main cast. Yeah. Including Odello. He deserved to uh, live a long life with, what's her name, Alicia. He gave her his little whale charm and everything. That was sad. His whale charm. Uh, so okay how many horrors are you gonna give the back okay. half i'm using guillotines brian oh there you go yeah guillotines okay first the last half that's what we watched this last half of victory gundam no one should be surprised listeners <laughs> i'm giving this one out of five guillotines oh, man. because it is essentially a waste of time please don't watch it watch something else don't even if you don't even want to watch a gundam series watch another anime series uh go for a walk <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I definitely did not enjoy the hours I put into victory Gundam part two. And I stand by that. I wish it was better. Interesting ideas. So many good ingredients that could have come out well, but they were spoiled. And the whole series victory Gundam, I'll give it 
one and a half guillotines out of five. <laughs> oh, it, it is, and the same reasons. It's still mostly unwatchable. The whole series in totality. Like maybe do it if you only want to be somebody that's like seen everything Gundam. But it it's not a good series. Please believe us when we tell you that. Watch something else. Brian, back to you. What do you give this last half of the series and what do you give the entire series? Well, I think the back half just, it was more of the same, I think, relative to the first half. So it has the same sort of problems overall. Show is bloated. It's too long. I think a third to a half too long. It's got too many characters. Just execution problems here, there, and everywhere. It's got things that don't make sense. It's got things that make sense. It's got to- it's got tonal confusion. It can't decide what it wants to be. And then when it does want to be something, it goes way too hard in that direction, like the decapitated head or the comedy bathtub. Oh, boy. Scoring this is really hard because I, th- I think conceptually, like, the narrative is okay, but the execution is just terrible. So I have, like, a very different problem with this show than I do something like Witcher Mercury or Double O. Those shows, I just completely disagree with the plot. Okay. Here, I feel like it's an execution issue, and I'm not sure which one's worse. <laughs> this one is more painful because it was longer than Witch for Mercury, but I think it's the sin is not as bad because it was bad the whole time, and I knew it was an execution problem, whereas Witch for Mercury is just we ignored logic and we didn't we didn't finish the show. I don't even remember what I gave the first half, but I think I'll just give the back half and the full show a five out of ten, which is a failing score. There's some good in the show, which is what's preventing me from giving it like a 3 out of 10 or 2 out of 10, because there are some things I like. I thought the the middle of the show was really good when they launched out of Gibraltar and went to space. That brief part in space was really good where they did the raid on the Zanskare colony. Again, I think in the back half, the last seven episodes, really good relative to the show. But that doesn't make up for the sum of the parts. And so all that pain, you have to take that into account too. So overall, I don't think it's going to be an enjoyable experience for really anyone to watch. If you and I don't have a good time with this show, Isaac, I'm not sure who's going to. No, nobody should. The designs aren't really worth the slog. Uh, the characters aren't worth the slog. The story is not worth the slog. Take it from Timiel yourself. Please don't watch Victory Gun. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Five out of ten guillotines for me. What did you have, Isaac? One and a half for the show? Right, which is a little less than yours, but yours is definitely not good. <laughs> no, no. I think I'm more generous probably on scoring yeah. than you, and for me to go to a five is tough. See, it's bad enough that I don't want to see side stories. I don't want to see manga prequels, manga sequels. I'm just kind of o- over victory, over his answer. There's one Victory Gundam side story. That's how bad it was. That we will we will try to read it. it. Maybe it'll just be me. Maybe Isaac just won't read it. But it's written, Isaac, by the Crossbone author. I'm in. So it'll it might be okay, you know. Uh, well, that's that's a great vote of confidence. I think it will be great, um, or at least better than the show. So I'm I'm optimistic about that. Then I mean, I'll say this, Isaac, that if if there was like a Gundam abridged, you know, like like DBZ abridged or okay. uh, or DBZ Kai. I think there's a 25-episode version of this show that's much better. I'll buy that. Yeah, I can see that happening. But, I mean, that's never going to exist. They'd have to afterglow a Z on it. Yeah. And if they ever want to revisit this era, they might have to do that, because I don't think you can ask someone to get invested in this to watch something that's a direct sequel. If we ever do revisit this era in animation, it's going to be more towards the G-Savior time than this because they need to set it far enough out from this so that people don't have to watch it yeah and they might even do it past g-saver because i don't think they, they definitely don't want people watching g-saver either <laughs> i'd almost want like a victorious gundam that's like a a side story happening at the same time with like a victory gundam that was a prototype or something like that and we see other elements fi- of the league military fighting zanscare and we hear about Uso and the Reinforce and all that, but it's it's just done so much better, and it's only like 15 episodes. Well, I think I think that uh, Crossbone manga is going to wet your whistle then because it Hopefully. takes place at the same time. Wow. All right, listeners, let us know what you thought about Mobile Suit Victory Gundam Part 2, the show on a whole. Isaac, you want to know what's really funny? Um, Guess. Uh, I was about to say that this series is like rated high in Japan or something. No. No. Our Victory Gundam episode was one of our highest watched episodes, (laughs) highest listened episodes. 
It's because nobody's seen it and they were very <laughs> curious. And now they know the horror that awaits them if they decide <laughs> to watch that show. I, I think you're right. I think it's because they haven't watched it. And so they're like, oh, I haven't watched it. They're going to tell me what it's about. <laughs> All Gundam fans have heard about it. Probably heard the rumors about the depression and the high kill count. And they wanted <laughs> to learn a little bit more about it. And yeah. boy, is there nothing good waiting for them. <laughs> All right, listeners, let us know your thoughts about anything, suits, designs, characters, missteps, the bathtub incident, the bikini squadron, the boob bite. Lay it on us. Any questions for your listeners, Isaac? After listening to this, if you haven't seen Victory, are you going to see it based on <laughs> what we've said? Or will this be just part of your the long list of anime that you know you'll never get to or never want to get to? <laughs> there you have it. Take us away, Isaac. All right, listeners, before you go to sleep tonight, stand next to your bed, put your hands together, get on your knees, look up at the ceiling, and hail the League Militaire. You caught a Gina loose. <laughs> Come on. She's doing. She's following orders. She's doing her best. <laughs> oh, God. What a space fascist answer. She was just following orders. All right. <laughs>